Good evening, everyone. We begin the readout tonight, 12 days into Vladimir Putin's ghastly war against Ukraine. And it is quickly becoming a humanitarian disaster. It's already the fastest growing movement of people in Europe since the Second World War. The U.N. says more than 1.7 million people have fled Ukraine since the first shots were fired there. The U.N. Human Rights Office has confirmed more than 400 civilian deaths, including 27 children since the beginning of Putin's invasion, but suggested the real numbers are considerably higher. While the White House confirmed the U.S. is collecting evidence of possible war crimes and violations of humanitarian laws. A U.S. senior defense official said Russia has now moved nearly 100 percent of the forces it had amassed around Ukraine into the country, with Russian troops trying to encircle the southern city of Mariupol. Under siege from a barrage of shelling over the weekend in violation of the ceasefires meant to allow people to evacuate, attempts to evacuate civilians were halted as the Red Cross says an estimated 200,000 are trying to flee the city. In Irpin, just outside of Kyiv, around 2,000 around 2, people evacuated safely today. Residents there have also been without heat or hot water for days and under heavy fire as Russian forces advance on the capital. Over the weekend, Russia continued the shelling as citizens tried to evacuate. Ukrainian officials said eight civilians were killed. At, UN Security Council meet, at, UN, at a U.N. Security Council meeting to address the situation, U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield called on Russia to honor Ukrainian proposals for safe passage. The humanitarian toll of President Putin's war on Ukraine is mounting. Children are dying. People are fleeing their homes. And for what? It's clear Mr. Putin has a plan to destroy and terrorize Ukraine. Earlier today, Russia put forward a proposal to allow people from Kyiv, Kharkiv, Sumy, and Mariupol to evacuate, but only into Russia or its close ally, Belarus. Ukraine, unsurprisingly, rejected that proposal as unacceptable. Russia claimed the move came at the request of French President Emmanuel Macron, who called Russia's plan hypocrisy. Meanwhile, today, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky pressed for more international sanctions against Russia, including boycotting Russian oil and halting exports to the country. What is needed is a boycott of Russian exports, in particular the rejection of oil and oil products from Russia. It can be called an embargo or just morality, when you refuse to give money to a terrorist. Boycott imports to Russia. If they do not want to comply with civilized rules, they should not receive goods and services from civilization either. Let the war feed them. President Biden and the leaders of France, Germany and the United Kingdom held a call and affirmed their determination to continue raising the costs on Russia. And tonight, a still defiant President Zelensky released yet another video showing he has still not left Ukraine's capital city and praising the fierce Ukrainian resistance. And joining me now, NBC News correspondent Cal Perry in Lviv and NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley live in Rivna, Ukraine. Uh, let's go in reverse order, Matt. Um, what is the status in Rivna? Um, what is the status of people trying to get out or get through there to get out? Yeah, we're not seeing a whole lot of refugees or, in, I should say, internally displaced people here in Rivna. We're seeing a city that is girding for war. You know, you mentioned Belarusia earlier. If Belarusia comes involved, then they could bring their troops right here, right over this area. And that's the real threat. This place hasn't seen a whole lot of bombardment. But there's a lot of worries here. I spoke with the mayor, and he, re he repeated that call for a no-fly zone. And, you know, a lot of people here, even ordinary people that I'm talking to on the street, this isn't some theoretical, geostrategic, geopolitical concept. Regular people are demanding, when they find out that I'm an American, demanding that there be a no-fly zone. And there's a reason why that's so difficult to impose, you know, because it, it would just have a host of repercussions. It would be a massive escalation. And NATO has made it clear that doing that would really mean putting U.S. military uh, service people right in the front lines in direct conflict with Moscow. And that would mean a major escalation. And it could mean something like a European-wide war. So this is the issue that a lot of people here keep pressing. It is the one wish of every Ukrainian person and politician that I speak to. It's for that no-fly zone. Joy? And just really quickly, to stay with you for a second, Matt, is that something that the people that you talk to really relate to the United States doing this, or is this something that they think that 
the EU, that NATO, is this something they're specifically saying to you? You said as an American, is this something that they are asking of us as a country or of Europe and the West? Yeah, I think that the, just as an American, uh, most of the crew that I'm with here are British. It's it's everybody in the West, really. And I think that, you know, they know very well that when it comes to enforcing a no-fly zone, the U.S. has the assets, the U.S. has the planes, and the U.S. has the military might to do something like that. And and that is something that they are acutely aware of and something that they keep repeating. Uh, and they're grateful, I should say. They are very grateful for what they've seen so far coming from the West. But they really feel as though a lot of the assistance has been a day late and a dollar short. Mm. And they think the no-fly zone is a way that the West can get in front of things. You know, one of the things that I heard from the mayor of this city, he said the Ukraine, Ukrainian people are fighting and dying for Europe. They shouldn't be fighting and dying so that Europeans can enjoy their lives. This is a sacrifice that the Ukrainian people are making on behalf of Europe and on behalf of the entire world. Joy? Yeah, they're not wrong. Um, Cal Perry, um, where you are in Lviv, and now we've just sort of seen over the last uh, 12 days that Lviv is sort of where people are sort of coming to to, to get out. What are you seeing there? Uh, what's the level of crisis that you're, that you're witnessing? Well, we're seeing an increase um, of awareness, I think, of the violence in the east. Far from where Matt and I are, there are these cities, a dozen or so in the northern part of the country, uh, that are under a state of siege, uh, where the Russians have surrounded these cities. They've cut off the power in the water. Um, and for days and days now, you have people who just don't even want to come out or go above ground. Then in the south, along the Black Sea, you have these strategic cities. You have Kirshan, which fell to the Russians. You have Mariupol, where they've been desperately trying to get people out, where we had one of those corridors actually actually succeed. A few thousand people were able to sort of just rush out today very momentarily. Those cities are just being shelled relentlessly by the Russians. And what you have arriving here are people from those places. The reason they're not arriving where Matt is and they are here is because of central train stations and, and the rail line just runs straight from Kyiv, the capital, to where I am. And so you have at least now, we've heard from the mayor here, 200,000 people have already been settled. That doesn't include the people who are sleeping on the street, the people who are sleeping outside the train station, the folks who are still waiting at the Polish border, or folks who have turned around and given up. It doesn't include people who have been dropped off at the border and are headed back to fight. The other interesting thing that's happened here when you talk about these negotiations is they've really broken down not just over the humanitarian corridor, but over a question that Matt is talking about, which is the airspace here and who's going to control the airspace here. There were at least two Russian jets, according to the Ukrainian army, shot down over Kyiv tonight alone. So this question of air power is going to be the key one going forward because it is the only thing that is preventing right now these Russian jets from just nonstop indiscriminately bombing the capital. Um, it is the fact that the surface-to-air uh, system that the Ukrainians still use is still functioning, um, and it is that Ukrainian jets are still in the air. So when you talk about NATO, that has to be part of the discussion, Joy. Yeah, indeed. Um, tragic situation, and thank you all for your great coverage. Really appreciate you. Cal Perry, Matt Bradley, stay safe. Thank you both. With me now from Ukraine is Sergei Stakovsky, former Ukrainian tennis player. Um, and thank you so much for being here and taking the time to talk with us. I know that you are um, back in your home country willing to fight for the freedom of Ukraine. Tell us what you're seeing, what you're experiencing right now. Well, it's, uh, it's a pretty desperate situation, I would say. Uh, Russia is bombing Kharkiv. Uh, they are trying to bomb Kiev, but not at the same scale as they do in Kharkiv. Um, they're bombing civilian sectors. They, they say they're attacking only military bases, but the fact is that they're destroying civilian compounds, uh, quarters. Uh, they are not able to enter the city of Kiev. That's where I am. Uh, it's uh, on the... On the ground, there is not a single soldier inside of the uh, of Kiev. They are stuck in the suburbs. They destroy the suburbs. Um, they are attacking civilians, uh, the ones that are trying to leave. Uh, they are attacking volunteers that are trying to bring some water and food into the, this, uh, the suburbs. It's, it's a barbaric actions that they're doing right now, actually. What, what it, it sounds like, and sort of what a lot of the analysis is, is that Russia militarily is not winning this war, to be blunt. They, they underestimated the ferocity of the resistance and the willingness of Ukrainians to resist. And so they are attempting to simply demoralize at this point 
Ukraine and deliberately, as you just suggested, target civilians, target people who are trying to flee and just flatten the country if they can't get uh, Ukraine to surrender. Um, is that the sense that you have, that this at this point is not a precision military exercise? It's just an attempt to level as much of Ukraine as they can and demoralize the people. Well, that's their plan, because on the ground, they don't have the morale to advance. I mean, the Ukrainians are putting a fight which they didn't expect. Uh, they expect they can be welcomed with a bread and salt, I guess, like in Crimea in 2014. But uh, Ukraine is a different country. Uh, for the past eight years, which we are in a war with Russia, uh, the people saw and understand that Russia brings only misery and destroyer. Uh, I don't know, disaster, destroyment. I don't know even how to call it. So nobody wants to ever be part of the Russian world as as they see it. So everybody's resisting, whether it's a whether it's a local uh, shepherd who has a farm with a uh, ships or chicken. I, it doesn't matter. Everybody is grouping up. They're making roadblocks. I, I was traveling into Ukraine. I passed through all of the. I, I crossed the border in Ushur from Slovakia when I was coming back into Ukraine, and I traveled through Ukraine and. You know, the the level of uh, uh, morale inside Ukraine is ex extremely high. Uh, people are gathering together, making groups, making a checkpoint, blocking the roads towards their little cities and villages, uh, taking their hunting weapons and patrolling the streets. Uh, it's uh, everybody's trying to resist. And uh, I do believe that on the ground, Ukraine is going to succeed. But the shelling is a big problem. Uh, because if we cannot uh, protect our cities, uh, the number of civilians and number of deaths is going to be extreme. And Russians yeah. are, Putin, they're willing to go the distance.